오케이. 이 되는 거지? 오케이, 된. 된. Again, let me just do the case. So it's a 28-year-old male who has these uh, this, the pulmonary VSD with MAPCAs that have been palliated with bilateral BT shunts to unifocalize pulmonary arteries. And this was done a while back. Okay, I can't control this right now. <laughs> okay. Um, so now, over the years, his left BT shunt had been occluded. Um, and basically, um, he was living off the right BT shunt uh, to the RPA, but the RPA, uh, the right BT shunt had been, uh, become stenotic and was stented by somebody else. And there was some residual RPA stenosis that had several angioplasties through the shunt uh, and really never lasted. So his saturations were running in the 60s. His hemoglobin was in the 20 range. He had frequent headaches. He was in New York Heart Association class three to four. Um, in fact, he had to, he's a young man walking with a, wheel, um, a um, walker because he just didn't have enough uh, exercise tolerance. He had regular uh, phlebotomies to keep his hemoglobin uh, at about 17, but it would always come back up. And it's probably due to the severe cyanosis. So we brought him to the cath lab. This is when I first got to Davis uh, for an RPA um, intervention with the idea that we might have to see where the stenosis is and stent it. And obviously this is going through a BT shunt. So this is the first picture. You'll notice that this is a very unusual connection here where this is a, um, a shunt that comes off the uh, brachiosophagic artery and goes, up in, goes to the right upper lobe. Now you can see uh, early on that the stent that was put in the BT shunt is probably a little too deep, right, all the way down here. But you also see that the um, contrast uh, goes into the right upper lobe, but whatever goes to the low lobe has to go medially through a stenosis and then out the uh, right lower lobe. So this is the, uh, uh, the, there's a stenosis in the orifice of the right lower lobe and a, a orifice stenosis in the right upper lobe. Sorry, this is right upper lobe, this is, should be right lower lobe. And so the course of the blood to the lower lobe, it has to go this way. So kind of unusual setting. So this is the first cath. Uh, we actually were able to get through to the, um, around the arch, up the uh, in, um, brachiocephalic artery, and then back down the shunt. And actually with the stiffer wire, that course straightened out a little bit. So you can see how we put a, a stent into that position, took a picture, uh, and see what happens here. So of course, with all the curves, we don't have a lot of control over the wire. And you notice as we inflate, notice that little subtle movement, right? So the, I'll show it again. You'll see the balloon had, uh, as the balloon was inflating, the stent actually shifted a little bit forward. So it's not in the right position now. We might have ballooned it, but certainly it's not holding up in the, the stenosis, it's not air. So we were able to put a second stent in, and this time we said the plan was to uh, telescope into the first stent. You notice how big this vessel is, and this was almost 18 millimeters, and uh, we had a 10 millimeter. Now that was done on purpose, because I was worried that the, um, an 18 would not fit this area. So knowing that this, the diameter of this stent was gonna be smaller here, the plan was actually, let to anchor in the stenotic region. Remember, we're still going through a BT shunt, so you can't put a huge sheath there. Uh, so we took a picture and we uh, implanted this uh, second stent. We'll, so this time we're slowly inflating so that if it jumps, we can bring it back, but you see that we're able to get it this time. Right? So now we implanted two stents uh, in telescopic fashion and we finished a little further dilation in this spot. So that's what it looks like. So in, in some sense, this, I was pretty happy with this at this time, um, and this is the picture. So not perfect, but better. Now the reason why I didn't want to put the stent all the way up to the BT shunt, uh, stent is because I want to make sure that I have access into the, uh, this stent if I ever needed to go there in the future. So I wanted a little space. That's why I thought that the second stent here, the, the shunt stent is, was implanted too deep because now you, you have no way of getting back through here if you had uh, um, put the stent, so that telescoped into the uh, stent in the BT shunt. All right, so that's what we have now. Of course, um, I want to show, it's, look at the curves that you're creating. You have a curve around the arch, a second curve down the BT shunt, and with the wire, it's straightened out. Now, in this particular time, we're trying to figure out how to um, access this, but I want to show you what happened. I didn't show you what it initially, there was two people, myself and a colleague, 
And we actually went to try to say, let's put a bigger balloon in here um, and try to attack uh, this against uh, the vessel wall there. So we put an 18 balloon here. What happened was that the balloon was stiffer and in the process of pushing and pulling, and I can tell as the wire is backing up, the, 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 because the curvature, the trick is not to keep pushing because you're just gonna create a bigger curve and cause everything to back up. So on the one hand, I'm saying, don't push, don't push, and the other person is pushing, of course. Then <laughs> next thing you know, uh, the curvature just pulled everything back, and you, you'll notice that the stent is no longer as a line. I think I wanna, uh, see, so at this point, when we pull back, you see how this, the stent is now shifting back to its native position away from that stenosis. Earlier, the stiff wire had actually kept it in position, but because of the manip manipulations, um, at this point, the, the stenosis is no longer on the stenosis. Um, again, the mistake there was probably going with a bigger balloon. Maybe we should have just said, leave it alone, let it endothelialize and come back, but that was the pursuit of perfection and paying the price. So here we are taking a picture, and you notice that the stent is uh, still in position, um, but what I want to point out is that there is a little bit of a, um, st um, a, the stent is holding up the stenosis just a little bit there. And I think actually that's much of a, a little bit of a fold because you notice when the wire went in, it was much more straight than that. Uh, so I think if there's a fold there. But nevertheless, we're able to make it a little bit bigger. And in fact, the saturation came back up into about this 75, 78 so. Um, at that point in time, I said, let's not make it worse. Let's leave it alone. His stats are better. And um, we'll bring him back after the stents endothelialize. Well, he actually did improve. His stats were in the mid-70s. He didn't need as frequent phlebotomies, and his headache uh, actually improved. We brought him back a few months later. All right, no, this is, uh, this is 19, not 29. Um, <laughs> so we went back in and said, let's, let's see whether we can go back through here and this time put a, another stent there to try to attach, get, uh, get that stenosis. Now, if, if you notice the course, again, very torturous course, or you have this arch course, one curve, a second 360 degree turn uh, down the shunt, and then medially and then laterally. Of course, with the straighter wire, the stiffer wire, it straightens out a little bit. Now at this point, I can't tell whether I went through the end of the stent or through the side, but I said, it doesn't matter. Even if I go through the side, I'll take the side. So uh, and here we are. Now this is another four or five hours into this procedure as we're trying to figure out how to gain access into this. So you see how we had the wire and as we run the, a stiffer sh system in, everything buckles every time. It will either buckle in this region or it'll buckle in this region and we just could not uh, get a good stiff wire and the, and the sheath in that position. So just, I'm just showing you some of the, the, the times, how when you're pushing, uh, this is just with a catheter going through. Here's a catheter with a wire, instead of, the sheath just backs up. So again, when you have lots of curves, these are very difficult to maintain stability of your coaxial system because of the curves. And there was three or four curves here. So it's, just want to say, as you're pushing this catheter, we're able to get the catheter down here, but see how every time you push a little bit, the sheath backs up. So then you have to start all over again. So again, lots of, we eventually was able to get a stiffer system. I said, let's just go ahead and get the sheath into uh, here so you can anchor that to go deeper. But see how, as you're pushing, the sheath just backs itself up. And just more, we finally get a wire all the way down, um, but we were never able to really push at getting this catheter through so I can put a stiffer wire in place, just to show you. So at this point, um, see how, just to show that when you have these coaxial systems with curves, every time you push something, something else backs up. And this is, we were able to finally get a balloon in there and I wanted to balloon the side of that stent as a way to just open something up there first. Uh, and if, in fact, with the balloon up, we're able to then run the, uh, with the balloon up to anchor it, you can then, um, giving some counter traction, you can actually now run the sheath in. So now we're at least into the, sh uh, the stent inside the BT shunt first, but you see how we're losing wire position each time. So now what we noticed is that we were having a hard time getting the catheter and sheath into that position. In fact, what you probably didn't see earlier was that we actually end up causing the stent in the shunt to narrow right at this. So that means that the edge of this sheath was probably right up against the, 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 the stent and all we were doing was just crushing it a little bit. Um, so we went ahead and did a few more ballooning to try to open up as, everything as much as we can and then you notice that the, the edge of the stent here had crushed through inside as the sheath was being, um, uh, try, to, try to advance it into the uh, stent of BT shunt. So at this point in time, this is four hours into the case, 
We cannot get the sheath in place uh, deep in there to be able to advance another stent. So the question is, what do you do next at this point? Um, I don't know if now is a good time to get some comments, but I know we have a shorter time, so I'm going to keep moving, okay? So I had spoken to our surgeons, and we thought, okay, maybe the best thing to do is come from above, rather than uh, trying to come from below where you have to deal with two curves. So the options are going to be a carotid cut down, um, which I was a little worried about because I think that eventually we wanted to get up a bigger, bigger stent and a bigger system. It would be a, a good size um, um, uh, sheath into the carotids. Uh, so another option, and that was the surgeons, our surgeons um, option, says let's do an axillary cut down. And in that sense, he says that there, uh, the surgeons sometimes that we use axillary artery cannulation. And I thought, hey, I never heard of that. So we went ahead and did this. So we brought the patient back. But before we did, we took this picture just at, uh, at the end of the last case to see what that vessel size is. And let me just play it back. So it's actually a pretty good size uh, axilla. Uh, artery here and so uh, we went ahead and did this so this is uh, two months later uh, we brought the kid back in and our surgeons went ahead and did a um, uh, access into the axilla and you'll see that with this you can have much more direct access into the uh, the vessel uh, down the shunt so here we are making our way down there and it actually was a quite an easy pathway of that wire into the the um, the uh, the stent in the pulmonary arteries, again, open up the side cells. I, I, at this point, I didn't care whether it went through the edge of, from the top or through the side. We just wanted to get something in there. And so now you're able to uh, open that up and then uh, uh, just dilate a few more of those uh, side struts to allow us to get this catheter in place. And with that, we're able to, without having all the second curves, third curves, uh, the force that you're pushing is translated towards advancing the catheter. So now we're making our way uh, through the BT shun, through the side of the stent uh, in the right lower lobe, and now to the lower lobe. And now you have a nice course with a stiffer system in place that can allow you to proceed with getting uh, a sheath in now. But notice this, every time we've done this, the edge of that sheath, as you're pushing on it, create a little more of a, a stenosis at the stent itself. Again, it may be because we're just catching on the edge of the stent itself. So eventually we actually have, you see how the stent had been distorted here. Uh, flow was still good. Um, we went ahead and ballooned that back up first. And then with the balloon up, now there's a little technique that if you actually advance the balloon and you inflate the balloon and use that balloon as you almost like your dilator, you can actually run everything through much more easily. Uh, so we're able now to advance the sheath deeper into the BT shunt. And now we went it through the edge of that uh, stent in the lower lobe. And now we're putting the stiff a stiffer system in just to uh, give us more more uh, support uh, to advance further. So eventually we open up this uh, side cell. You can see the, the, there's a waste there. Uh, probably uh, went through the side of the first roll of cells and then uh, just ballooned it some more to give us a little more pathways. Notice that there's a little waste from that little edge that we had created when we first attempted to put in the sheath. And uh, we just keep going here. Oops, wrong, wrong sequence here. But you'll see that basically we just use serially uh, larger balloons and eventually dilate it up and see what happens as you inflate the balloon. You can actually, uh, as you deflate, uh, advance your sheath along the edge of the balloon. Again, keeping a little bit of a taper so that it doesn't get caught on any of the side cells. And so eventually we're way deep into the right lower lobe stent now. And again, this is just a technique that I think everybody should learn that inflate the balloon, let it deflate. As you deflate it, the second person advance the sheath. And so you can see you can go further and further into the area of interest. And so now we actually are able to easily pass another, uh, this is a Vallejo stent into position. And this time, I just wasn't as worried about trying to keep a spacer because the key thing was I really wanted this area to be opened up. Um, so we went ahead and, and stented that area. <coughs> and then uh, this is the, uh, the final picture here. So, um, and this is how it looks now. So when we compare the pre and post, just so you can see the difference, you've, um, 
It went from 4.6 millimeters to 7.3. Here, the, the, this is all palliation. The patient was too old for anything else, and all we needed to do is try to get more flow into the lungs so that he, his sats are better, so he leads a better quality life, not having headaches and being able to be a little more active. So I just want to just show uh, uh, what our surgeons did. Basically, it's an incision here right underneath the clavicles, identify the axillary artery, and basically here, here we are, you see the, the markings, um, and here's the initial incision, the shoulders right here on top, just to give you the orientation. And then you can isolate the, the um, axillary artery right here. Um, and what th the one thing that I thought was interesting is that he actually took a graph, a Gore-Tex graph, and sewed it into the axillary artery as a way to allow us to get in without worrying that we would damage the vessel itself. So I thought that was a very novel way of, of doing this. Um, I know you do this for, for ECMO runs and from, the, from below, from smaller kids, but the, the, the Gore-Tex uh, graph was then uh, uh, tied to the sheath and then basically he inserted that Gore-Tex graph and attached it to the artery temporarily so that we can use that for, for the uh, insertion of the sheath. So here's the, the sheath going into the Gore-Tex graph that's sewn onto the axillary artery and this is the position uh, uh, looking at it from the side of the table. Um, so with that in mind, we're able to access that vessel. I thought it was a very novel way of, of accessing uh, vest areas. And uh, to me, it was a nice highlight of how the interventionists can truly collaborate with the surgeons. Uh, there are things that they can offer that we just don't know about. And I think there are things that we can offer. So as a team, I think we can actually do a lot more than what we can do individually. That's it. Uh, thank you.